So raise your hand if it's your first time with us here. Cool. Welcome. So this is Acts Biblical Training Center. We are meeting at the campus of Washington College Academy. There are two congregations here that flow together in unity. Okay? <laughs> Pastor Scott Hillman, Pastor Jorgen, Pastor Terry are the leaders of River of Praise and the ones spearheading Acts Biblical Training Center. Pastor Scott's running with the vision. He's the president of the school. And he's overseeing lots of things. Keep him in your prayers. Amen. And we have joined together. We are, we are having Lord. Can you just, amen, everybody? Amen. It's really cool. So, hallelujah. Hi, my name is Matthew Hi. Miller. Hi, everybody. And we have a congregation called The Vineyard. Okay? Hallelujah. Amen. Wow. May the Lord speak to us. Let's pray. Father, speak to us today. You've already spoken. Hallelujah. You've already poured your spirit out. Thank you, Father. Breathe on me and help me share your word today, Lord. Help me. Hallelujah. Amen. So the name of this teaching is Flip the Switch. Flip the Switch. Okay? So we're going to talk about, with the help of the Lord... What does it mean when the Bible says that you'll be endued with power? What does that mean? And then we're going to look at what is the purpose of the power that we are endued with. Okay? Hallelujah. Rabbi Nachman said, study is not the main thing. Action is the main thing. So, if you've not noticed, the Hebrew Roots Messianic movement are very, very much into study. And that's, that's not bad. Right? It's not bad to study. But there are many fellowships, not this one, but there are many fellowships that are stuck in study, knowledge. But what the Lord wants to tell us is that the things that He gives us and the outpouring of the power is not just to reside in us, it calls us to be a witness. A witness of what? Torah? No. The gospel of Yeshua, which brings salvation to men. And then when we disciple men, we teach Torah. See, when we do discipleship, family, we do two types of disciple. Two, help me, Lord. When we do outreach, when we do outreach, when we go on the streets, we're doing two types of outreach. We're trying to find people that don't know Yeshua, and we just give them Jesus. See, Jesus to the lost. Everybody say that. And then, if somebody's trapped in a religious system, and Christianity is a religious system, if they're trapped in the system, we give them Torah. So Jesus to the lost, and come out of her, my people, to those trapped in religion. Amen? That's what we do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. So, turn to Acts chapter 1, or open your phones, whatever you're going to do.
Halleluja. Acts 1, we're going to read 1 through 8. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Yeshua had begun both to do and teach until the day that he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had also presented himself alive after his infallible proofs, being seen by them for forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them, Do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he has said. You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they come together, they ask him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses. Say witnesses. Witness. To me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So many times, family. See, I come from a Pentecostal background. And so many times in the Pentecostal circles, and by the way, speaking in tongues is real. All the gifts of the Spirit are real. What God is doing is He's restoring the whole Bible. And many times in the Hebrew Roots Messianic movement, people struggle with the gifts of the Spirit. But that's a part of the full gospel coming back. It's a part of the restoration family. But... Many times what we do is we just focus on speaking in tongues when we want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what it's about, family. That's an that's a evidence that you have it. And it's an amazing, awesome thing that you do want. You're like, I don't want it. I'm, you do too. I'm, no, 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 not me. Yes, you do. Listen, a couple of days ago in here, five people filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. Two of them came and testified and said, I can't even believe this happened to me because I thought y'all was making crazy noises out of your mouth. I didn't even believe it, they said. So if you're in that category, like you don't even like, what are they doing? It's not real. Just ask the Lord. Amen. But the purpose really of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so that we will leave this place with our batteries charged and go out there and talk to people. The harvest is plenty. Family. I was, I was at Kroger. And if you've been following us, you know my position on COVID-19, okay? But I'm not diminishing people that are in fear or people that like my grandparents, they're very, very sick and elderly, so they wear a mask before COVID. So we don't want to judge people, and I'm telling myself that because up until last week, I was judging these people, just how brainwashed they were. I'm sorry if you're a mask wearer. I'm so, but if I was like, they're brainwashed. I was judging them. And my wife said, she said, honey, what is Shavuot about? I said, what do you mean? She said, these people with the mask are the harvest. They're in fear. Why are you, why are you like talking bad about them when you get in the car? Why aren't you sharing the gospel? Why aren't you praying for them? I was like, oh man, that's amazing. So guys, when you're at Kroger, Walmart, wherever, you say, can I pray for you? Start a conversation with people. Don't judge the mask. Pray for the person. Their soul is hanging in the balance, possibly. Some of you have never shared Yeshua 
Cold turkey evangelism. Some of y'all have never done it. Shavuot's tomorrow. So you might not get a chance today because you're probably going to be here all day. And then tomorrow, we go to the flea market or something. Test it. Test. Did you get power to be a witness? So maybe you don't. Maybe we're here all day Sunday. Maybe Monday we're going to be here all week working. So maybe next week we might go share the gospel. I don't know what's going to happen. Okay. Sometimes you might got to get some gas. Okay. Sometimes you're going to the grocery store, right? But I'm here to encourage you by the Spirit of the Lord. We need to get out on the streets. At least once a week, family, you should talk to somebody about Yeshua. See, everything we learned in the Christian church is not bad. Can't throw the whole thing out, you know. We've got to be sharing the gospel. So when it says, when the scripture says, In Acts 1 4, wait in Jerusalem until you get the promise that was spoken of. What is that? Where do we find this promise that's being fulfilled in Acts chapter 2? Where do we find this promise? I don't know, but let's turn to John 16 and see what happens. Let's look at what Yeshua said to his Talmudim. See, one of the things, family, that God wants to also do, He wants to move us from being believers to disciples. Have you ever thought of that? Many of us are believers. I believe in Yeshua. I believe in Torah. I believe in the feasts. I believe in what, you know, the five books, right? But are we a true, true disciple of the Master? There's a difference. So what is this promise? Where do we find the promise that is fulfilled in Acts 2? It's right here in John 16, uh, verse 5. But now I must go away to him that sent me. But none of you even ask, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has now filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Listen to this. It is to your advantage that I go away. Wow. Wow. So many times, family, have you ever been in your life and you're like, I just would like the man, Yeshua, to be here so I could hug him. I want the man, like the man. I want to just ask him, what do I do right now, Yeshua, my king? What do I do? I want the man. I want to feel his beard. I want to hug him. I want to feel his heartbeat. I want to smell him. I want the man. You know what Yeshua said? It's better that I leave and not be here as a man. Why? Why? What we have access to family through the indwelling Holy Spirit is better than the man being here. Think of that. We want the man. He's like, it's better that I leave. I have to go. Trust me, I have to go. See, we haven't tasted that yet, family. We don't know what it's like to, to have such a degree of the Ruach that we don't care that the man is at the right side of the Father making intercession. He's praying for us, but we're walking in a measure of the Holy Spirit that we're with Him. Yes. See, that intimacy, intimacy is accessible. And the only thing that stops us is our flesh and our lust and our sin and our selfishness. And our family, 
If one of us would catch on fire, we might be able to touch somebody and it spread. It only takes one man to sell out to the Lord to start a revival family. One man. But you know what the Lord said earlier to us? He said he was watching us. He's pretty happy. So praise the Father that he gave us a word and encouraged us. See, many of us in here have pressed into the Lord. But there's a group that hasn't. And I just pray that if you didn't press, that God has mercy on you and still touches you. Amen? For real, I can challenge people at times, okay? Just smile. If I don't leave and send the helper, he will not come to you. But if I depart... I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you. Listen to this. Listen to this. See, things hinge on us. Things hinge on the degree that we can handle what God wants to do. Listen to this next sentence, family. Yeshua, in truth, says this. I have so many more things I want to say to you guys. Just think what, just think what John 16 could have had in it if the Talmudim would have been ready. We don't even know what he wanted to speak. But they couldn't bear it. That's something to even just think about, family. I'm telling you, you can hinder what God wants to do in your life, or you can take hold of the hem of His garment and say, take me with you because I know God's with you. I'm going with you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you live, I'll live. Where you die, I'll die, and there I'll be buried. You can't bear these things now. But listen, when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own authority. Whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me. He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. Therefore, I said... He will take what is mine and declare it to you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that He sent His Spirit. He continues to give His Spirit. And we are promised, family, one of these Shavuot, that He's going to do it again. Amen? May it be tomorrow that we see something amazing. See, everything that we learned in Christianity is not bad. You can pray to the Holy Spirit, family. Why? He's God. You might not like this, but there's the Son, who is God, the Holy Spirit, and so is the Father. Oh, he's Trinity, he's Catholic. No, it's not. That's the Bible. We don't blame it. We can't blame our Catholics for everything. For real, you read their catechism of faith... It says, there's not three gods. So, go read it. Quit blaming them for everything. I believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen? We get, really, we get legalistic in Hebrew roots. So, this is what Yeshua says to His Talmudim, to His disciples. He's got to go. He's going to send the Spirit. And then, in in Acts, that's what it says. It says, this promise that you already knew about, what promise? There it is. That when He leaves, He's sending His Spirit. Amen? So turn with me to Matthew 5. Verse 20. 
We know this really well because we like to use this one when we're sharing Torah. Right? Y'all know Matthew 5, 17, 18, 19, 20. You got it memorized, I hope. Hallelujah. I'll just start at 17. We'll go to Matthew 5, 17. But we're going to focus on 20, okay? We're going to focus on 20. Where did my book go? There it is. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Do not think that I've come to destroy the law or prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the Torah until all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments as teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this. This is very, very important because this is what is going to help us. One of the things that's going to help us identify a disciple versus a believer. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? This is a great commentary on the Gospels from an amazing Jewish sage back in the day. I call him a sage. Um, that's an Orthodox Jewish man that was a believer in the Messiah that did a, a commentary on the Gospels. But what he did is he showed how that Yeshua over and 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 over was quoting from the sages of that generation and the oral tradition that was already in place, even though it wasn't codified and written down for many years later. What does it mean when Yeshua says, your tzedakah, your righteousness, if your righteousness is not greater? Listen to this from his commentary. The truth is that performing the commandments is the main principle of Torah. But, everybody say but. If you perform them and do not adhere to having good character attributes. See, we've been dealing with this by the Holy Spirit for over... See, God's telling us, and everybody that's watching, it's not enough to just do the outward commands of Torah... If you're not holy on the inside, if you're not intimate with the Lord on the inside, take your seat off. Why are you playing? If you do not also have good attributes of character, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Huh. Just as it says in the Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, everyone who follows the Torah but does not do it for the fear of heaven is like a treasurer entrusted with inner keys, but not the outer keys. How can he enter? The Torah is likened to inner keys. For the Torah and performing the commandments is the main key. But in, however, in order to come to the goal of Torah and the commandments, you must have good character attributes. They are required. Continuing in Babylonian Talmud, Shabbat 31b. Woe to him that has no courtyard. Listen to this. But makes a gate to go in the courtyard. In other words, woe to the man who has no fear of heaven. It's the fear of the Lord, family. That will keep you holy on the inside. If you don't fear the Lord and know that He's watching you when nobody's around, 
You just might not make it. You might not be born again. Born, really born again people cannot stay in sin. I mean, you, you, if you're struggling over and over and over and over, you got to check yourself. You got to make sure. Because we don't understand the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is not just getting you into heaven. The grace that comes through the gospel gives you the ability to say no to besetting, evil, wicked, chain-binding sin. It does. But I read a book years ago because it was called, uh, it was, my dad gave it to me, it was called A Child of Light Dwelling in Darkness. So there can be a season of a child in darkness but you can't stay there and be born again. It's impossible. The man who has no fear of heaven but still engages in Torah study will not make it into the kingdom. Therefore, first prepare a place, listen, in which the Torah can be upheld. It's called the inner dimension of the Torah. He must purify his heart through fear of the Lord. Hear me, family. A true disciple purifies his heart through the fear of the Lord. Listen. Listen. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Do you know what a pure heart is? It does not mean without sin. In the Hebrew, it means polished. That's some good stuff. That's a whole message. When one has Torah and good character attributes, they will together qualify him to enter into the kingdom. Now then Yeshua goes and He takes it so deep, family. The inner dimension of Torah is not the outward things that we do. The inner dimension of Torah, family, is when you start dealing with your thoughts. And that's what God has had us doing. He's had us going and He made me confess in front of everybody something I was thinking. Why? Because that's sin. At the, at the expense of embarrassing my wife, I confessed thoughts. You know if you think of something, you did it. you get it out of your head. If you, that's how strict Yeshua's halakha is. Yeshua's halakha is, deal with this. So he talks about just being angry for no reason. Thinking of a man or woman lustfully. You've already done the act, right? Moral, holy, Holy character attributes, inner dimension of Torah, dealing with the thoughts, taking every thought captive, make it submit to Yeshua, right? Number one, that's really important. Number two, you do or don't do what Torah says, right? When you do those things, as his disciples did, Yeshua can actually give us something called authority that Pastor Scott spoke about last week. Turn to Matthew 10. We're going to talk for just a minute on what's called jurisdiction. See, I want to, before tomorrow, the heart of the Lord for us is to have some instruction. Because when you see at the end how the Lord's going to tie all this up for us, it's going to make sense because tomorrow we've got some stuff, I think, some stuff that's in my head, in my heart that I feel the Lord's going to do. And we're going to pray for y'all and release. I'm 200 evangelists into the world. 
<laughs> Amen. Right, Will? Hallelujah. Matthew 10. When he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power, say power, power. over unclean spirits to cast them out, and he gave them power to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease, and then it lists them. Do you think the disciples were dealing with the inner dimension of Torah? You better believe it because Yeshua can read your mind. Peter's like, Lord, don't even look at me. I can't even, oh. For real. Isaiah saw the Lord and he was like, I'm going to find clean lips. I'm going to die. You know, he saw Yeshua. So I'm pretty sure they were keeping it holy. <laughs> Hanging with Yeshua. You don't want to walk up to the rabbi and he's like, I saw you uh, last night. He said that to the uh, one guy, and it was a good thing. He was like, I saw you under the tree. He's like, oh, my Lord and my God. Right? So I think these guys, I think these guys were holy and doing Torah. Right? So here's what he did. He gave them power. Power what? Over unclean spirits and to heal. So when we look that word power up, Pastor Scott touched on it last week. Exousia. Did I say that right? Close. I'm not a Greek guy. I had to just, if you were to see my notes, it's not in Greek, it's in English transliterated. But listen to what this word power means. It means lawful authority or jurisdiction. I want you to think of this. And this, if we can understand this and then get tapped into the power that he's going to give us through the Shavuot experience, and we can, like Pastor Scott said, we can be submitted to the Lord. Do you know what submitted to the Lord means? It means you're dealing with your thoughts. That's the ultimately thing. Pastor Scott, 21 days ago, 20 days ago, when we all first started, he said, Lord, don't let us get away with anything even in our thoughts. See, as soon as you have a thought, if you're not struck that that's bad, then you have a serious problem with sin. If you can let it stay there for longer than a second or two, you need to go judge yourself and do some work on the inside. Serious. But those of us that are really pressing in, I'm expecting jurisdiction to be reassigned to the body. If you can look at prayer, family, as legal jurisdiction... I have permission is another word. I have permission and legal authority to tell you demonic stronghold to leave. I have legal authority, jurisdiction over you in the name of Yeshua, sickness. Leave. And we don't have to scream and do a backflip in tongues. We just can say it. <laughs> so these men... This is our example. How many of you want to be like this? How many of you want to be entrusted with legal jurisdiction? Like, like Pastor was saying, the Roman says, I recognize authority. You just have to say a word and it'll happen. So I believe... My opinion. One of the issues is why that we don't walk in that power. Pastor Scott gave us one reason. We're not submitted to the Lord. And I think it's exactly what we're learning today is that we're not dealing with the inner workings of Torah, dealing with our mind. Because if we're submitted to the Lord, then our mind is clean and holy. So if we have a clean mind, Mind, and we're dealing with our thoughts to the inner dimension of Torah to where you don't let your eyes wander at the grocery store, men and women. You don't even think about ripping somebody off on a business deal. You don't even think about it. 
If it comes in, make it leave in the name of Yeshua. You immediately, if you make it leave, you're fighting the good fight. If you dwell on it, family, you're losing the battle. If you fight and war, you're doing the right thing. Fight the good fight. So I believe that we could get that legal jurisdiction, authority, power granted to us again, family, if we have both keys in our possession. Amen? And then what's the other thing? What, is, what else does it mean to be a disciple? It means you lay everything down that's yours. Or at least be willing to build a house and then sell it. <laughs> he, might not, he might not like have you walk through it, but are you willing? Have you said to the Lord, it's all yours? Every area of my heart is yours. Everything that I own is yours. Somebody wants something, what does Yeshua say? Not what you say. What does Yeshua say? Not only give them what they want, give them something else that they didn't ask for. Every one family, this is the test of a disciple. Have you taken your cross and followed him? Do you crucify yourself daily? Because everyone who is given houses and homes or left homes and houses or left brothers, sisters, fathers, or mothers, or even wives and children, or fields for my sake, will receive a hundredfold in this life. And guess what? Everlasting life later. The cost of discipleship is everything. So you can stay a believer. You can. You can just be a believer. You believe, and you're saved, and you're happy coming to Shabbat, and, and you, you did your deed, and then you go home and do whatever you want. Or you can transform yourself into a disciple of Yeshua. And that's up to you. That's only up to you. How many of you want to be disciples? You want Him to see you one day. You want Yeshua to see you one day when He hugs you and He wipes all your tears that day and He hugs and He looks in your face and He says, you were actually one of my disciples. And, and He tells you that He's longed to actually, because you know, He wants to touch you as much as you want to touch Him. He's a real man. He's actually got flesh forever because of us. You know what I mean? He cannot get out of his glorified body. He decided to put a human suit on forever because of his love for you. So as much as you want to hug him, he wants you. Will you sell out for him, family? That's what Shavuot's all about. Will you sell out and be a disciple? Will you lay everything down Will you do what he says quickly? Because that's the definition of humility. Do you know what humility is? It's when he speaks, you do it fast. Because the longer you wait, the less likely you are to do it. And sometimes there are windows of opportunity and Yahweh needs you to move right now. Well, uh, as the seconds tick by, shoo, your opportunity's gone. Now listen, the Pharisees, do you think they had both keys to the kingdom? They had one key. Listen to what Yeshua says about the Pharisees. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You pay tithe of mint and cumin. Things you don't even have to tithe on. But you neglect the weightier matters of Torah. Justice, mercy, and faith. These you should have done. And not leave the others undone. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Woe to you, Hebrew rooters and messianics who blow your shofars and tie your seat and love Torah portions, but don't deal with sin in your life. Woe to you, hypocrites. You clean the outside and worry what people are going to think about you. You wash the outside, but inside you're filthy. Full of self-indulgence. Blind. You're blind. Go clean the inside of the dish. And then work on the outside. See, there are so many more Christians that got it together than the Hebrew rooters sometimes. I've been saying this. You know why? Because they're dealing with the inner dimension and they're doing the weightier matters of Torah. You know what we got going? We got it all here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We got pastors that are wanting us to do it all in this place. Yeah, look, don't take this. Look, this is a blessing, family. This right here is an absolute blessing. Woe to you. You're like a whitewashed tomb. Outside, beautiful. Outwardly, amazing. But inside, full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So do you think these guys had both keys? They had no power. They had no authority. You don't want to be caught in that place. And if you are, I'm going to tell you some good news. Get your heart right with the Lord while you're still alive. I almost died yesterday. <laughs> like, for real. My, every muscle in my body cramped, and I fell into a ball on the floor and blacked out. I really thought I was dying. I didn't really even realize that. Like, I was laying in bed last night. I was, I was like, thank you, Lord. I stayed up just thanking the Lord that I'm alive. Like, my I started thinking, what would have happened to my family? So drink water when you're fasting. This is tea. I've had water today. Thank you to Ken. Have you ever tried to open a trash bag with your knuckles? <laughs> I was in such a ball... I knew I had to throw up, and I also knew Ken likes his leather seats. <laughs> so I was trying to open a bag like this. And if he didn't pray in tongues and prophesy that I'd get it in the bag, it might not have gotten the bag. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Ken told me later, he's like, I was praying that you was getting that in the bag. Like, I know you like your cars. That's a good. <laughs> Thank you to whoever. I don't know what happened. Apparently, a bunch of guys carried me out of here. Thank you, whoever. Who, who carried me out of here? Raise your hand. Bill, and thank you. And for everybody that prayed, thank you. And for Krista, she took care of me. You are, Joshua, you are blessed. She... <laughs> Hallelujah. But you don't want to meet Yeshua because there's a tragedy, a car accident, you die in your sleep, something awful. I mean, you know, our breath is just because of His grace. So here's the attitude we need to have. We need to have the attitude that Paul had, who says this. He counts everything as rubbish, and all he wants is to know the Lord. I put no confidence in the flesh, he says. Though I myself, I have reasons to put confidence in the flesh. If somebody else thinks they have a reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more reasons. 
I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a descendant of the children of Israel. I know what tribe I'm from. It's Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard, in regard to the Torah, a Pharisee. Zeal, I persecuted the church. Righteousness based on the law, faultless. You hear that? Righteousness? So you can do the righteous deeds of Torah, and either Paul's lying, or it's attainable to do the deeds of Torah. It's attainable. But the mind is the problem because later he says that he's struggling in his mind with sin. And sometimes the things that we do or don't do aren't in the Torah because he says, things I know I should do, I don't do. Things I'm not supposed to do, I do. But he says this, all of those things that I just mentioned, they are nothing for the sake of gaining knowledge of intimacy with the Messiah. I consider all that nothing because of the surpassing worth of knowing Yeshua. The, knowing Yeshua. Do you know Yeshua today? Do you know Him? For those things, I could lose all those and consider it garbage that I may gain more of the Messiah and I may be found in Him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Interesting. But that which is through faith in the Messiah. This righteousness comes from God on the basis of faith. So I want to know the Messiah and know the power of His resurrection. And participate in his sufferings and become like him in his death. So somehow I might attain the resurrection of the dead. That needs to be our attitude. We need to be... Ze I love Torah. I love Torah. I eat clean. I study Torah. I was trained with a rabbi. I'm a Torah teacher, Torah lover. I pursue Torah. But I love the Messiah. Amen. I love Yeshua. I love my best friend. So what's this? So God is saying to us, we need two keys. If we'll get these things right and deal with the inner dimension of Torah, take our thoughts captive, and do the deeds, or don't do the deeds, he might just restore his authority to us, his legal jurisdiction power. But overall, we need to count that as nothing and just really press into getting to know the Messiah through the Holy Spirit, which is better that he's not here and that the Spirit's with us. But there's a prophecy in the Bible, in Acts 15, it says that God is in the process of restoring the fallen tabernacle of David. The fallen sukkah. Now, if you study this, it, the word sukkah is in there, not ohel. Ohel is tent. Sukkah is an open tent. So part of the power of Shavuot is this restoring the fallen sukkah of David. What does that mean? When David brought the Ark of the Covenant in, and it was in a place for a set time, he didn't build a regular tent. He built a sukkah. And a sukkah has three sides, and it's open in the front. And for a set amount of time, people could come and look at the seat and throne of God. People could sit before the Lord and pray and sing. What does it mean, the power of Shavuot? What does it mean, the fallen sukkah of David is being restored? I'm telling you, it means that we're going to be able at some point in the future to sit before the throne by the power of the Holy Spirit and look straight at the mercy seat. That's coming, family. In Acts 1... 
uh, talks about this too. It says, so the, the power that God, I believe, is going to restore to us, legal jurisdiction, exousia. But there's another power that's coming on Shavuot, and it's dunamis. Everybody say that. And this will give you power to be a witness. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all over the earth. What does that mean? Dunamis. It means power. Power, it means power, ability, and excellence of soul. That's really interesting. Ability and excellence of soul. See, there's some things that we need the Holy Spirit to help us with in our fallen nature. And so there's two things that come during the Shavuot experience. Power to be a witness, but power to have that inner dimension of Torah keeping, mind controlling, excellent thought, thought, excellent soul. All of that is another dimension of the Shavuot experience. So the areas that we're trying to deal with in our mind that we still struggle with, the power of Shavuot is to give us victory to have an excellent soul. Amen? May it be so. Amen. And with that comes the ability, because when you're doing the inner dimension of Torah on your own, you're trying your best, and you get that unction of the Holy Spirit that helps you deal with your mind, and you've been granted legal jurisdiction, then you have confidence, family. And confidence is faith. And faith can move mountains. Peter denied the Messiah family. I don't know this guy. He even cussed, whatever that means. He said swear words. You know what happened after Pentecost, after Shavuot? Men and brethren of Israel preaching the gospel. Some of the Torah teachers and leaders, they said, something's different. He's been with the Messiah. He goes from denying the Lord to boldly preaching the gospel. Put in jail. I will not stop proclaiming the good news. You want me to listen to you? Put in jail again. Miracle. That guy you put in jail, they're preaching again. Bring him before the Sanhedrin. I will not stop preaching the gospel. They flogged him, family. You know what? The Sanhedrin had authority. They were the, they were the uh, legal power. They beat the disciples and sent them out. And you know what they said? Praise the Lord that I got beat for you. See, Paul says something amazing, family. He says, I fill up in my present suffering what is lacking in the Messiah's suffering. What kind of mysterious statement is that? That our suffering somehow fills something up in what he lacked in suffering. The gospel will cost you your life if you're truly sold out, just like John had his head cut off. That word witness is martyr. I give you power to be a martyr, and the more you're like Yeshua, the more people will hate you. Is your holiness and gospel preaching drive people crazy? Or are you just chilled out? May the Lord wake us up. I'm not telling you to be a jerk, by the way. I've done that enough. See, the power of Shavuot is to transform us, family. Say transform. 
Kosher animals have two signs. Two signs. You know what they are? You know one of them's outside, one of them's inside. Inner dimension of Torah, outer dimension of deeds. Now the pig is sneaky. The pig has an outward sign of a split hoof, but you can't see on the inside he's not chewing the cud. And some people, maybe hopefully not in this room, with tzitzit on, look kosher, but inside you're a pig. And those are the ones that will stand before the Lord one day and say, Lord, 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 no, not me. No, I did all this stuff for you, Lord. No, Lord, no, no, it's me, Lord. Remember me? He's like, I didn't even know you. So in the same way, see, when Peter had the vision of the animals, these are synonyms, Torah. The Torah of Israel, that right there, the Torah, not that, but the Torah, the everlasting Torah. The land, people, these are all synonyms. Animals are synonyms for people. So in the same way that animals have to have two kosher signs, we need to have two kosher signs, inside and outside. We don't want to be like the Pharisees, family. Amen? Now, here's what's interesting. I just learned this. Sackcloth is made from primarily one of two materials. Goat hair or camel hair. Now, I found this out. This is great sage of Israel, very, very, very popular in the mystical realm. The Arizal. The Arizal taught this, that when people put on sackcloth and ashes, they're transforming their nature into the priest that cleaned the altar and took the ashes away. Why? Because there's this interpretational method called atbash, which... Ask me about later if you want to know. And you take the word for sackcloth and you transform it into the word linen. And so men and women, those of you that took it serious and put on sackcloth and wiped ashes on your head at least once, you transformed yourself into a priest. And in doing that, in that action, you're begging the Lord to fix the things that you can fix. See, you take a kosher animal and you put it on the altar in the temple and you burn it, you can never get rid of it. Your animal nature, you can never get rid of it. You can burn it, but it will still be ashes and you have to clean the ashes every day. Until we're glorified, we're going to deal with ashes. But if we don't clean the ashes, they pile up and snuff out the fire. Turn to Acts 3. You guys all right? I'm not keeping track of time. We're almost finished. I've just been going through acts. I want this stuff in my life, these experiences. Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Why were they going to the temple to pray, and what were they doing? They were actually praying from a book. Yeah, they were tongue talkers. Or they were going up and using a siddur because three times a day the prayer book was read. They went up for the time of prayer. There was a man there from his mother's womb that was born lame. 
And they would bring him there daily at the gate called Beautiful. And he would ask alms of the people that entered the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go in the temple, he asked them for help. Fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Yeshua, the Messiah of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he went leaping and running into the temple, praising God. Everyone knew he's the one that sat bag begging. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. As the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together with them in the porch called Solomon's. And they were all amazed. And when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. His power to be a testimony and a witness just kicked in and he starts preaching again. Listen to what he says. This is the key that's going to take us into our next train of thought for this message. I want everybody to focus. Listen to what he says. Very, very important. Peter saw it. He responded, men of Israel, why are you marveling at this? Why are you looking at us? Why do you think it was our own power, say power, or godliness that did this? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified His servant Yeshua, who you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go, and you denied the Holy One and asked for a murder to be granted to you. You killed the Prince of Life, but God raised Him from the dead, of which we are what? Witnesses. And in His name and through faith in His name, He made this man strong. Whom you now see. Yes, faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of everyone. That's powerful. Because listen, what's the name of this message? Flip the switch. We've got to realize. That if Yeshua decides to grant us legal jurisdiction again because we are working on the two realms, inner and outer, and we're in humility because we do things quickly when He says, and we take our thoughts captive, if He was to restore that, and we also got dunamis power from the Holy Spirit, and we started doing miracles, we would have to have this attitude and say, this got nothing to do with me. And we have to shoot all glory to God. Immediately. What is electricity? Jeff Seaver, who's not here, came to my house. Do a little work. While he was working on my uh, fixture, he explained electricity to me. Okay? Now, I could really mess this up. Hmm. Help me, Lord. And then I went and met with a friend of mine who's in our office building, and uh, he's upstairs. He's an electrician. I went and asked him for some insight. But... There's this interesting thing, like if you have power in your circuit breaker, it has to go all the way to the light and then come back to the circuit breaker. Do y'all know that? It's, it's a circuit. If you break that, the light goes off. I see that? God is the battery. He's sending His Holy Spirit. Now, last time I preached, I told us that there was a connection between Shavuot and Jubilee. 
Seven times seven is 50. Seven times seven is 50. In the 50th year, liberty was proclaimed. On the 50th day, liberty is proclaimed. What is liberty in Hebrew? It means no blockage. Think, think, think with us. I didn't know all this then. I'm telling you, God builds the messages if you're focused. So why did He tell us that then? We know now. If we are totally without block, see, He's not just going to give you the Holy Spirit so you can just enjoy it, family. I'm telling you. It's not just for you, family. If you're without blockage, you should be able to reach out, touch people, do miracles, preach the gospel, and then watch them return the glory to God, and the cycle continues, family. Amen? So that's us right there. The Holy Spirit's coming. He's lighting us up. So in your own life, you've got to give glory to Him and complete the cycle. But look what can happen. Look at this. This is, this is a thing. <laughs> it's a real thing. One light bulb can touch another light bulb and turn that thing on. As long as that other light bulb goes back to the source, it works. It's pretty cool. I like this one. Because this on the right over here, it shows the, on the right, it shows the power going to the light bulb. And then the other light bulb, those are people. He's not going to trust you with his power if he can't even trust you now to go preach the gospel on the streets. I never, I'm not an evangelist. Listen, I've heard this too many times. That's not my job. Huh? I'm not an evangelist. Then you're not a disciple. Be a believer, and hallelujah, I'll see you in glory. You don't want to be a disciple? Don't be a disciple. You don't have to. But a disciple will take the power inside of him from the Lord and go out and touch people, and tomorrow is Shavuot family. And if he does something, you got to settle it in your mind now that you're not just going to hold on to that. So you commit to the Lord, you're getting out on the streets. Amen? If you don't actually make a plan to do it, and think about it, you won't do it. You'll go to Kroger, you'll go to Walmart, you'll go to the park and just play with your kids. You have to realize that you're not your own, and you're actually the, you are Yeshua to everybody that don't know Yeshua. You're Yeshua to everybody that don't know Yeshua. So what, how would Yeshua see people? What would the apostles do? Right? Oh, check this out. Pastor John taught us this. It's called the triangle of grace. Coming down, the word grace is charis. Say that. Is that right, Pastor Scott? Now, a believer gets grace from God. Now, the believer is lit up. But the believer now has to take this thing called gifts of the Spirit, or charisma, charisma. And when the believer takes grace, same root word, and touches other people, other people get lit up. And then when they give thanksgiving to God, it's the word grace again. Eucharista, thanksgiving. And that's the circuit of power. And if you just take power and you ground it, there's explosions. It's called lightning. But if you take power and add a light, and then you circle it around, the light lights up and there's no explosions. So if God was to just give you power and you ain't going to share it, you're dead. <laughs> For real. Power must, the power of God, family, listen. The power that God wants to give you must be invested in something to complete the circuit. Hear me. Hear the Lord. If the power is not invested in something, the circuit is not complete, there's no use of power. 
Just explosions. Everything has to go back to the source, just like in the breaker box. And everything has to go back to the source of life. Amen. Acts 3, 4, 5, amazing stories in there. Amazing stories. And every time you see this pattern, I want you to hear, hear this. When you're reading through Acts, somebody gets power from God, shares it with somebody else, they praise God. Why? It has to happen that way. It's a natural thing. After these things, the Lord appointed 70. Luke 10. We're closing with this. Here's going to be our pattern because Pastor Ken and Pastor Tom, where's, where's Tom? Okay. Pastor Ken and Pastor Tom are preparing some outreach for us for the summer. Okay? How many of you want to do outreach this summer? Okay, y'all believers and some of y'all's disciples. Okay, that's all right. If you try one time, go out with us, whoever us is, you'll, you'll want to do it again. You'll want to do it again. Don't let fear stop you. But we're going to pattern it after what the Bible says. He sent them out two by two. So when we do these outreaches... We're pairing people up. Why? Bible says to. Bible says to. Two by two. It's what the Mormons, is it the Mormons? The Mormons? Jehovah's, Mormons and Jehovah's, they follow the Bible better than we do. When it comes to outreach and sharing their twisted doctrines, at least they do that part. The harvest is truly great. COVID-19 created a harvest field of white. Family, we're coming off, if it's Yahweh's will and He would pour out His Spirit, it would be just a beautiful timing, in my opinion, because of the fear of the people. They're lost. They're lost. You have the keys to life, family. Think not what you're going to say, guys. You can't predetermine it. Every conversation is different. You just got to stumble through. Uh, 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 Jesus, he down the cross for you. If you can get that sentence out, you did your job for the first round. For real. <laughs> the harvest is great. Acts Biblical Training Center. But the laborers are what? Have you ever prayed this prayer? Tom just said this the other day, and I thought, I've never even once prayed this. Lord, send forth workers. I never I have never prayed that till recently. What do we, you ever wonder what to pray? Yeshua just said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he sends out some laborers. And be willing to say, he nanny, I'll go too. Go your way among, go your way as lambs among wolves. 
Carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals. Greet no one along the road. That's meaning just be focused. Whatever house you enter, first say Shalom Alechem. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest. If not, it'll come back to you. Do you know that's actually real? Do you know that when you go in somebody's house, we should have the custom of saying Shalom to this home? If there's peace there, somehow it stays. If there's not, it comes back to you. What does that even mean? It's real. If a son of, of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it'll come back. Remain in that house. Eat and drink. If you enter a city, receive whatever they set before you. Heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God is near you. This is the pattern of the Bible. I'm, not a, I'm, I'm learning this, that the legal jurisdiction authority combined with the excellence of soul, both dimensions of walking out this life, dunamis power, is the kingdom of God within us. And, and it says, heal people, then preach the gospel. That's what it says. So that means we need to be walking up to people and saying, can I pray for you? What's wrong? I'm just praying for people. Because if they get healed, they're going to know it, and then you can tell them about the Messiah. A lot of times we do it backwards, and there's nothing wrong with doing it backwards, but... but Luke 10 tells us the pattern. Everybody say pattern. What's the pattern? Do a miracle first. And then you tell them the kingdom of God has come near. If you go somewhere and they don't receive you, go out and kick your dust off and say this. The kingdom of God was near you and you rejected it. We actually supposed to say that. Why? The Bible says to. Listen, guys, Torah portions are good. Get back in the New Testament. You, you, why'd you halfway say amen? Oh, did you say all the way amen? Sound like you slowed down. Ken. Oh, good. Two people amening. I'm telling y'all to get in the New Testament, man. <laughs> Listen, here's what we're releasing at, at, at Sukkot. Matthew and I have already worked this out. He actually did it, and I'm saying Matthew and I because it was my idea. So <laughs> we're going to give out the Torah portions for the year plus a one-year read the Bible cycle. It's already done. We're releasing it. We're going to give it to you guys, and it's going to have, as you read the Torah portion, you just read a few chapters a week, you got the whole Bible in a year. And that way we're not stuck in Torah portions. Amen? What if we read the Bible every year? We would be changed. So that's coming soon. Amen. That's it. This is the pattern. So the first disciples had moral character, and Yahweh gave them a special dose of power to move with legal jurisdiction, to bring miracles to people for the sake of preaching the gospel. Shavuot is given to us so that we can walk out the power of the gospel fully. The Torah is given to us so that we can walk out the covenant of Abraham fully. The Brit Hadashah was given to us so that we can have justification. Shavuot was given so that we can have power to live out justification, touch people's lives, and see the world changed. So let us come tomorrow ready. If you didn't wash your clothes, I'm being serious. Wash your clothes, do the mikvah, and come ready. 
No intercourse with wives till Sunday night. <laughs> For real. We're trying to follow what the Bible says to do everything in our own, every, whatever we can do, we're trying to do it. So be ready to receive power for inner cleansing. And then we can take this power of Shavuot and exercise our legal jurisdiction and do exploits in this area and watch the gospel explode, family. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, Pastor. I'm going to close this out.